be life with us, please. Sometimes sorrow is a door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift to me. You're faithful, faithful in all things. And every high, in every low, mountain tops, down broken roads, you're still my rock. My hope remains, I'll rest in the arms of Jesus, come what may.
salvation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my
set his heart on his spirit, on his love, on his face this morning. Quiet the voice of doubt again, echo within me every promise that your word be louder than my fears. Speak to
for today. Thank you for the space. Thank you for um, just being present with us um, and whatever it is that we have to give this morning, Lord. I pray that in all aspects of the sermon, Lord, that our eyes are set on you, our hearts are ready to receive whatever it is that you have to speak to us this morning, Lord, and that we would be willing to make room for whatever it is that you're calling us to. Lord, we love you. We honor you. I pray that you speak through Aaron as he delivers the message. I pray that you speak through the community meditation, um, through offering, through worship, through song, Lord, whatever it looks like. God, I just pray that in all things that you are active in our presence this morning, that you are speaking to us and that we can hear your voice through the words. We love you. It's in your name we ask all these things. Amen. You guys can be seated. All right. Good morning. And welcome to Worship with Restore. If you're visiting with us here either in person or online, my name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor of this community. And today we continue in our idolatry series, a study meant to address and remedy some of the modern day idols we've adopted in our culture. As I said last week, whether we like to believe it or not, we're an idolatrous people in this country. We may not be setting up golden calves or making sacrifices to other deities like Baal or Zeus, but we still have plenty of things that we are figuratively bowing down to. In the temples that are our hearts, we've placed things that don't belong there, things like the statues of old that we need to remove, tear down, and destroy. For anything, and hear me when I say this, anything that we put before or in the place of God is an idol. Anything that we put in the place of God or put before him is an idol and violates the first two commandments given to us through Moses. As it is written, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an image, any object of worship, in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Nothing, church, is to supersede or take the place of God in his commandments. And this includes things like comfort, which we talked about last Sunday, and what we'll talk about today, it's often idolized antithesis, work. This Monday tomorrow, and I didn't plan this, so it works out perfect, but this Monday tomorrow is Labor Day. A day first federally recognized Back in, you guessed it, 1897, where according to Wikipedia, so I did my research, where to honor and recognize the American labor movement and the works and contributions of laborers to the development and achievement of the United States. In more plain language, it's a day set aside to celebrate all the hard work the American people put in annually to make the country great. It's a holiday where we're supposed to have paid time off to rest and appreciate our work. It's meant to be a small way for employers to thank their employees and acknowledge the hard work, the good work that they do. Yet statistically speaking, and this is so shameful, only 60% of people last year got off on Labor Day. The highest percentage you can find is about 70. So let's say about 65% of Americans actually get off on Labor Day. Even worse, many who do get the blessing of a day off end up finding some work to do anyways. It's a perfect example of the fact that we as a people collectively know that time off is important. But we don't respect it. We know in our heart of hearts that time off is important, but we don't respect it. And the reason why is that the majority of us have made an idol out of what we do. Think about it this way. And when you're meeting somebody for the first time, you are probably asked what your name is, and then what do you do, right? It's so interwoven into our identity Because we have made an idol of work. All some of us do is work. There are people who don't know what to do if they're not working. 
who feel lazy when taking a break. That's me. We lack hobbies. We miss the joys of family and have no time for friends because some of us are only working. At some level, we've all bought into the flawed philosophy that is the American dream. The belief that anything can be achieved through sacrifice, risk-taking, and hard work rather than chance. Yes, don't mishear me, church. This is the land of freedom and opportunity. But we're often too busy working, striving to be successful. We ironically give up our freedom and miss our chances to actually enjoy the life that the Founding Fathers envisioned for us to have. In America, we get what it means to work. What we don't get is what it means to rest. And it's the reason most of us are so tired and so burnt out and unhappy with our lives. Along with all of this, and our continual problem of breaking the first two commandments, we have a habit, and this just makes sense based on our work ethic, we have a habit of disregarding the, first, the fourth commandment altogether. We treat the Ten Commandments as if there's nine, which is to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shavat, which means to cease. It means to stop. It means to rest. It means to do nothing. As Moses commanded, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant, nor any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy, which means that he set it apart, making it different from the rest of the days. Citing the example of God's creation of the world where he worked for six days and rested on the seventh, Moses leaves no space to argue with him. For if God, as Isaiah says, the creator of the whole earth, who never becomes faint or grows weary, rested, what makes you think, being much weaker than him, that you shouldn't rest in a likewise manner? Apparently, you're stronger than God. That's at least what we're communicating. In his explanation of this commandment, Moses makes it clear that God does value time off just as much as hard work. And therefore, man should value them the same. Think about it this way. Out of the ten most important commandments in the law of God... The day of rest is listed fourth. Something that was not abolished with Jesus, as some people would have you believe, but like all of Moses' teaching in the Old Testament as a whole, has become amplified in significance. As Jesus himself professed, do not think that I have come to abolish what is written in the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in the book of Hebrews, we find such an understanding applied and explained plainly for us. As the author states here at this church, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their, talking about Israel's, example of disobedience. In other words, although Jesus grants the Christian access to a daily rest now, praise be to God, we can have a Sabbath in some way every day with Christ. We also have an eternal one later, which is better than any of the ones we have here. But what this is also communicating is that a weekly Sabbath is still expected. 
It's to look into, it's to communicate something greater, of course, but it still stands. Even though our application of it may look somewhat different than the Jews before us, the Lord expects us to take time off to rest and recuperate. As Paul understood it, some of you think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike or common. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Paul's talking about the Sabbath, okay? Some people think it has to be on a certain day. Some people think no day is important. But what I'm telling you is you should be fully convinced that whatever day you take is acceptable to God. Notice the issue, at least in the Roman church, wasn't whether or not to take a Sabbath, but rather what day that Sabbath should be taken on. To which Paul essentially says, it doesn't matter, just take one. Something the majority of us don't do, though we should and are called to because we're stubborn. Because it's not what we've been taught to do. It doesn't always feel natural because it's not what we're used to doing. Because taking time off, let me just get real with you, taking time off opposes some of our lifestyles. Taking time off opposes an idolatrous view of work. Which brings me to the main point of this message that we'd start to break down the idol we've made of work by restoring Sabbath rest. <clears throat> we have all been disobedient in this area, okay? And we will continue to be in some capacity. And whether we realize it or not, every time we miss Sabbath rest, it's to our own detriment. The Sabbath is a gift from God given for our enjoyment and betterment. He doesn't need it. It's just as important as the hard work we pride ourselves in as Americans. As we're about to read, Jesus teaches us clearly that the Sabbath was made for man and that we'd be foolish to disregard it. My point is simple. We would all do well to get some rest. Amen? Yeah, I should get an amen from everyone. <laughs> Issues, church, with finding a balance between work and rest is unfortunately not a new thing. Ever since Adam was first sent out to toil, <laughs> we found it difficult as a people to stop working. We also see this very early on and often in Jesus' in Jesus' ministry as Jesus is continually confronted with misconceptions and questions associated with honoring the Sabbath. However, at least in the New Testament period, it would seem the Jews of Jesus' day had the opposite problem that we have in the present. So legalistically bound to the Sabbath, they lost sight of why they were taking it in the first place. Whereas we ignore good rest to work, they ignore good work to rest, and there must be a balance, both of which fail on opposite ends of the spectrum to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so that being said, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to go ahead and start turning with me to Mark chapter 2. If not, you can use one of the Bibles that are under your seats or follow along with the words on the screens, but we are going to be reading what Mark records in chapter 2, verses 23 through chapter 3, verse 6. So Mark chapter 2, verse 23, and the story goes into chapter 3, so we're going to end in chapter 3, verse 6. <clears throat> and Scripture states, starting in verse 23 of 2, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were saying to Jesus, Look, why are your disciples doing what is not lawful on 
the Sabbath. Look, why are your disciples doing what is illegal on the Sabbath? One thing that you will recognize, church, and you'll hear me say this with every, probably every single line, is ironic. Because every single thing that is said by the Pharisees carries with it in this story a sense of irony. Now, the Sabbath day is Saturday. Okay? In ancient Judaism, in the ancient world, Saturday is the Sabbath. So we can point to the exact day in which this is going on. So it's Saturday. It's supposed to be the day of rest. And Jesus is traveling on the Sabbath day with his disciples. And as they're going along and, and, and they're teaching, they go through a grain field and some of the disciples pick some of the heads of grain and eat it as a snack on their way. The irony here is that in Deuteronomy 23, 25, we read this. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears from your hand, with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Essentially, don't go into a neighbor's field and start cutting down their grain for yourself. But if you are passing through and you are hungry and you need something to eat, you are allowed to take some to sustain yourself. Now, this was taught to the people in order to continuously communicate that God's blessings to them was supposed to be shared with people. It's the same way that after the harvest would finish, there would be kernels of grain and stuff left on the ground. We see this in the book of Ruth, where Ruth is a widow, a homeless widow, and so this was a way for her to be fed. And so she would go through and pick up what was left behind, and that was totally legal. So, according to the law of Moses, the disciples aren't doing anything wrong here. All right? They're not filling up their <laughs> satchels with grain for later. No, they're just taking a little bit to sustain themselves on their way to get food or wherever else they were going. So then why do the Pharisees say, what you're doing is not lawful? Because there's this thing called the Mishnah, which is additional Hebrew teachings on the Old Testament. So if like the hundreds of laws weren't enough for you, there's thousands more in the Mishnah. And to the Sabbath command of Moses, by this time the Jews had added 39 additional laws. 39 additional laws. And one of those laws was that you can't reap on the Sabbath. So the irony here is that their own tradition opposes another law within the Torah, within the instruction given of Moses. We see this happen all the time in churches where they choose a tradition over what the scriptures say. Okay? But that's what's going on here. They're also, it's weird that they're considering picking a couple kernels of grain as reaping or harvesting. But that's what they're saying. And so they look at Jesus and they say, are you going to allow your disciples to do what is dishonorable on the Sabbath? And then in verse 25 we read this. Jesus said to them, I love Jesus. He always responds with questions or stories, and this is both. Have you ever read what David did? Have you heard of David, King David? Have you ever read about him? There's a story um, in Samuel, in 1 Samuel, um, and we read this. It says, when David was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, remember when they entered the house of God? In the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. You guys remember that story? So Jesus calls back to King David, and he says, remember that time David was on the run from Saul? 
And he and his little band of mighty men were hungry, they were starving, they were fleeing for their lives, and they went to a nearby village, and they went to the place of worship, and they go to the priest that's there, and they say, do you have anything to give us? And the priest doesn't have anything to give them to eat except the bread, the unleavened bread, which has been consecrated for the time of worship. The closest thing we can get to that in our context is communion. So it'd be like essentially the priests prepare communion and that's all they have to give. And they look at David and David's in need and so the high priest breaks the law to help someone in need. And so he gives them the bread and David eats it and he is sustained by the bread of God. See see the point there, right? He's sustained by the bread of God and so is able to continue on forward. So, Jesus gives us example from 1 Samuel chapter 21. And Jesus is using the story to call out the Pharisees' legalism and their ironic idolatry of the Sabbath day. And I say ironic because they have made an idol out of the law of God. They placed adherence over heart. They were so focused on following the law that they lost sight of its message. That there are some laws that are over other laws. Right? What is the commandment of commandments that Jesus gives us? To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and to love others as ourselves. That's chief. If we miss that one, we cannot fulfill the rest of them. So Jesus uses this story to call them out, essentially. But he's not done. Jesus says something very bold and powerful. He says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And saying the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath, Jesus teaches two conceptual understandings that are essential to our understanding, to us understanding how to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. The first is this, that the Sabbath was given by God for the benefit of humanity. God doesn't benefit from our Sabbath. We do. It's ours. It's for us. It's supposed to be a much needed day of renewal, rest for the body and worship for the soul. And the second thing that Jesus is pointing out here is that the Sabbath was not given by God to make men slaves to ritualistic observances. He is not giving us the Sabbath just to give us another thing to do. It has purpose and significance, and like anything in the Old Testament law, it's preaching a much greater message. So Jesus says, you are serving the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was meant to serve you. He got it backwards. And then he says, the Son of Man, talking about himself, Jesus' word for, or term for the Messiah, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus makes a very bold claim here that he is the ultimate authority of how the law is to be interpreted. Yeah, you can tell how they probably got upset with Jesus. I know this better than you because I'm the Messiah is what Jesus is saying. He's saying... He is the ultimate authority of how the law is to be interpreted. And in the context of the story of David, it's as if Jesus is saying, if it was permissible for David to eat consecrated bread when he was in need, which violates the law, I think it's okay for the Messiah and his disciples to eat a few kernels of grain, which is in accordance to the law. But the story continues says again in chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus entered the synagogue. He entered the place of worship. And a man was there with a withered hand. 
And they watched Jesus, the Pharisees, to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Now, whether Jesus' synagogue appearance is on the same Sabbath as the grain argument is up for interpretation. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because here's the thing. Regardless of if this is the exact same day, which I would argue it does seem to be the exact same day, <clears throat> Mark places these stories next to each other intentionally. What was taught in the field through the picking of the grain and the example of David is about to be literally illustrated for them clearly. But we see the conflict continue. So let's say this is on the same day. Jesus and his disciples are on their way to worship. Maybe Peter slept in a little bit and they weren't able to stop for breakfast because no place would be open on the Sabbath anyways. So if they didn't have time to prepare something beforehand, there was nothing to eat that day. You would not eat on the Sabbath day. So for whatever reason, they are without food. There's a grain field on the way to the synagogue. And so they pick a few kernels of grain and eat it. And on their way, they're stopped by another group of people who are on their way to worship. The other church people who then start judging them for what they're doing. Not because it goes against the law of God, but because it goes against their tradition or what they're comfortable with. There's a little bit of an argument, but they kind of put it aside because they're all going to worship. And so then they all enter the synagogue together and they enter this time of worship and jesus knows the hearts and intentions of the people sitting next to him he's like they thought the conversation was done in the field but you just wait sometimes what would happen is guest rabbis which jesus was if they showed up at a service they were given an opportunity to share something from god if they had anything and so apparently Jesus takes advantage of this, and I'm sure the Pharisees are like, oh, great, here he goes. And Jesus goes up, and he's before the people, and he says, come here, man with withered hand. And this guy comes forward. The Greek literally means to come into the midst. So essentially, he is calling the man out of the congregation and making him go up in front of everybody. So you gotta wonder with this guy, too, like, Jesus doesn't give any context, nothing. He just points to a guy and goes, come here. And he comes forward. And what's, what's the, the next thing of irony, church, is that they see him call this crippled man forward and go, you know what? I think he's going to heal that guy. There's, there's no doubt that Jesus has the power to heal somebody. They know that he can do it, and they still don't see it. They're like, I bet he's going to heal on the Sabbath. And it says in Mishnah 1, 2, that you can't heal on the Sabbath because that's work. We laugh, but church, we do that all the time. I know the place I was pastor before, sometimes we literally would be starting the worship set, and if it was a song somebody didn't like, they'd get up and walk out. Right? Come on. This stuff happens all the time. When something just doesn't go along with our particular preference, we miss what's actually going on, that we're in a place of worship. That God is active and moving. All right? That's why we're there. We're not there to look better. We're not there for anything else but Jesus. And they are not there for Jesus. And they literally know that Jesus has the power to heal this man, and they're like, I hope he does it, because it gives me reason to yell at him. Verse 4, we read this. And Jesus said to the Pharisees. Now, notice, there has been no conversation between them. So Jesus just calls them out without even asking, hey, what are you thinking about? He turns to the Pharisees specifically in the congregation and says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill someone? But they were silent. But they were silent. 
Now, in Greek culture, specifically in um, when you would have um, philosophers debating, the ultimate sign of victory is if your opponent had nothing to say. So you would go back and forth and you'd share different views and if someone got to a point where they couldn't respond, then the conversation was over and you won the argument. That's how it was determined. And so that's what we're seeing here is that Jesus asked them a question and they are so hard-hearted, they don't even respond. Jesus goes, would it be better for me to do good or bad today? Should I save a life or should I kill? And they have nothing to say. Then it says, Jesus looked around at them with anger. This is one of the few times in the Gospels where Jesus is depicted as angry, as in furious. And the reason why? He was grieved at their hardness of heart. He was so upset that these, these are the Pharisees. These are the people who study the scriptures backwards and forwards. They're the ones who memorize it. They're the ones who teach it. The expectation for them is very high. These are supposed to be God's messengers to the people, and they don't care about people. And so Jesus is angry at their hardness of heart. And it says, then he turns to the man and says, stretch out your hand. It says, the man stretched it out, and his hand was fully restored. And then the Pharisees went out immediately. So as soon as, they, as soon as Jesus heals this guy, they get up and walk out of the service. And where do they go? It says, they went immediately and held counsel with the Herodians, which was the political party of the day, against Jesus. And they tried to figure out how to kill him, how to destroy him. So here's the irony again. As Jesus is preparing to do good, the Pharisees are preparing to do evil. As soon as the man is healed, the religious leaders reach out to the political leaders and plan to kill Jesus. Jesus and his teachings, here's the thing, they disrupt their comfort. They undermine their influence. They oppose their way of life. And this is because, church, following Jesus calls for repentance. Repentance not limited to instant change, but also gradual and continual change. Jesus often challenges our typical way of living, and when this happens, we have a choice. We have to choose whether we're going to change with him or continue to rebel against him. And unfortunately, the Pharisees, at least in this narrative, there is some hope because after Jesus' death and resurrection in the book of Acts, we are told that whole groups of Pharisees who once opposed Jesus convert to worshiping Jesus. But at this particular moment, in this particular narrative, they choose the latter. In thinking they're honoring the Sabbath, they're actually dishonoring it. And in the end threaten the Lord of the Sabbath. So once again, irony. Growing up, my bedroom was on the second floor of my parents' house. And on the wall, you can ask my mom, across from the bottom of the stairs, my mom used to have this rectangular wooden plaque um, hanging with the Ten Commandments listed on it, right? But for some reason, they were like the redneck or hillbilly version. Um, 
For example, I remember instead of it saying, do not covet, it said something like, don't be hankering. You know, and uh, y'all don't cuss instead of, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. It wasn't the best translation, all right, um, nor the most theologically sound, but every time I came down the stairs, I'd find myself just because it's in my vision, I would see, find myself reading at least one of them. It's weird, but it's kind of how I learned the Ten Commandments. Um, of which the fourth is to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Although I'm sure it said something like, and I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure it said something like, like get on to church, or like, keep the Lord's Day now, you know, or some, something like that. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but anyways... Thankfully, the Lord replaced with the redneck version with the real version. Um, but anyways, the point is this. God used this goofy board. I'm sure my mom just only hung up humorously to teach me some of his most important instructions. However, because no one ever really explained to me what the Sabbath is, outside of what was more often referred to as the Lord's Day, my understanding was limited to ritualistic practices I was just like a Pharisee. I was told by my pastors and teachers, like the board said, that the Sabbath was the Lord's day. And to recognize it meant I had to go to church every week, and that was it. And this is how I treated the Sabbath most of my life. I was led to believe I was made for it, not realizing it was made for me. So I served it. For this reason, in high school and college, I always refused to work on Sunday mornings. I have never worked on a Sunday morning in my entire life. When I applied for a job and Sunday mornings were required of me, I remember I, I, there's a few times I got some like really good opportunities, even in high school. Um, and they were like, well, every fourth Sunday you got to work. So I didn't take the job. And every time, God provided another job for me. Um, wasn't always what I necessarily wanted to do, but he always did make a way to provide for me. Um, so I'd turn it down and look elsewhere. And here's the, here's the, this is where the story gets weird, okay? If the hillbilly thing wasn't weird enough. When I got rebellious and I stopped going to worship, when I stopped going to church, for several years, which I think we all do at some point in our walk, if, if not before it starts, we all rebel in this way, I still wouldn't work. I had no excuse to have Sunday off, but it's the Lord's day, and even if I'm not worshiping him, I can't work. A clear sign that although it was a good habit to establish, it had become nothing more than a ritual for me. That's all it was. It was a ritual. Now, for some of you, my story, as well as the poor example of the Pharisees, is relatable to your own, which is why I share it, because I want to show that the problems of the past can still crop up in the present. Nevertheless, as I mentioned at the beginning of this message, for the majority of you, in a modern-day American context, especially for those of you who did not grow up with Christian influences, you most likely have the opposite problem that I have. Your problem isn't that you're making improper attempts. Your problem, I should say, isn't that you're making improper attempts to uphold the Sabbath. It's that you don't even observe it regularly or at all. You've got your priorities mixed up. You've been misinformed. You need to remember you have ten commandments, not nine. You've made an idol out of work. It's too much of your identity, and it needs to be dismantled. Some of you are going to be really encouraged by this next line. Some of you are going to feel bad, but you work too much. You work too much, and that's why you're tired, that's why you're burnt out, and that's why you're unhappy. Hear me when I say this, Restore. You're so much more than what you do. And some of you looking at your jobs are like, 
praise be to God. That you are so much more than what you do. You have divine permission. So this isn't just from me. You have divine permission, a God-given command to slow down at least once a week. So take advantage of it. Take a much-needed break because taking a break isn't being lazy. There are more important things than work. There are more important things than your job. It's just a means to an end. It shouldn't be both. Yes, it has its purposes, but that shouldn't be your sole purpose in life. You were made for more than just work. You were made to enjoy life. What did Jesus say? I came to give you life, that you may have it to the fullest. And he's not just talking about heaven, he's talking about this life here right now, too. You need to value time off just as much as you value the hard work you should be putting in. God gave you six days to work. What's wrong with taking one to relax, recuperate, and worship? The answer is absolutely nothing. It's actually the right thing to do. It's what you're supposed to be doing. To not take a Sabbath, church, isn't just sinful. It's unhealthy. That grass can be mowed another day. All right? That overtime isn't always necessary. Most of you probably work five days a week, right? In some capacity. You probably work five days a week, so I'm just gonna, that's the average, all right? What does that leave you? That leaves you two days. That leaves you one day to work on your personal affairs, and it leaves you another day to spend time with your loved ones and God. You gotta learn how to rest, church, to honor your Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I say your Sabbath day because that's how I want you to start seeing it. It's not God's Sabbath, it's your Sabbath. We rightfully call Sunday the Lord's day, right? It is. Because it's the day our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's a day as passed down to us from the apostles where we set aside some time to worship. We should be in a space like this if we can on Sunday, okay? But that doesn't mean that Sunday also has to be your Sabbath. For example, in the early church, the Lord's Day and the Sabbath Day were often treated as different days. Sundays, Sunday was the Lord's Day, the Sabbath was Saturday, just as it was and is for the Jews. The way a typical work week looked was Sunday through Friday, people worked. Maybe they didn't put in as many hours as us, I think. I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out, how they had time to do their laundry and make food. They, they simply could not have worked as much time as we do at our jobs, okay? But they would work Sunday through Friday. Then, on Saturday, they would rest. And if they were Christian, Sunday night, they would go have dinner and worship together someplace. These early practices combined with the teachings of Jesus and Paul tells, tell us that although we have a right to recognize the Sabbath on the Lord's day, we don't have to. Your Sabbath day can be another day. It can be Monday. It can be Tuesday. It can be any day. <laughs> any day that can be taken. Because here's the thing, it's not the day that matters. It's that we actually take it that's important. Like any vacation time off work, those of you who, or who do have vacation time, most of you, it's up to you to take it. Right? And what happens if you don't take it? You either use it or you lose it. It's up to your own discretion. God gives us a day off for a reason, okay? And we can either take it or we can lose it. 
He knows we need it, and we're foolish to think otherwise. He didn't make the Sabbath for himself. God has no need for rest. Rather, as Jesus said, he made the Sabbath for man. He made the Sabbath for us. I have a pilot friend named Matt. He works like a ton of days on and then a ton of days off. He's got a very unique schedule, so he doesn't have that nine to five. His job is very stressful, very taxing. Um, and I don't know why, but <laughs> I don't know why he asked me when he did, but one night Allison and I were playing cards with him and his wife, Gina, and he would do this randomly. I don't know if it was just like to distract me, but oftentimes we were on the same team, so I don't know. But in the middle of the card game, and I don't remember what it was called, but it's a really fast-paced card game, okay? It's not like you're playing Go Fish or something. Like, it's, you're going hard. And in the middle of this card game, as I'm his teammate, and as I'm trying to get my cards down, he says, hey, Aaron, am I sinning when I disregard the Sabbath? I'm like, I, uh, you know, now he's going to be mad at me because we're losing. But stunned by the randomness and bluntness of his question, I was taken back a bit. And eventually, I don't think it was that convincing, but I just kind of said, like, yes, and then played my next card. <laughs> he then asked sincerely, but with my job, I only have every other Sunday off, so what should I do? And some of you may be thinking the same thing this morning. And if that's you, I want you to... I want to say to you the same thing I told him, and that is, it's not about when or where you recognize the Sabbath. It's about you taking it. It's not about when or where you take the Sabbath. It's about you taking it. So I told him, pick a day you can rest and make that your Sabbath. That doesn't excuse the fact that you need to be having times of worship, time like this. But if you're fortunate enough to be able on Sunday to come on the Lord's Day and worship Him and honor the Sabbath, more power to you. If you are unable to, that's okay. It's only an issue when you disregard it altogether. For me, it's Monday. So Monday is my Sabbath. It's why some of you get frustrated with me when I don't answer my phone on Monday. Um, I, I may do a few things around the house or go get groceries or whatever, but whatever work I do for the church, especially like whatever like administrative tasks or things like that that I have to do, um, I reserve for the other six days. And I do not do it on Monday. And here's the thing. If something comes up and I need to work on Monday, that's perfectly fine. And I do that. A few, a few months ago, we had an issue with a passing of a, of a client at Holly's House of Hope. And they called me and said, I need you to come in on Monday and do counseling. I was like, okay, so I'm coming in on Monday. I'm not saying, well, it's my Sabbath, can't help you. Right? No. I go and do the good that needs to be done. But what that means is that I got to pick a different time. If something comes up I need to, and I need to work, that's fine. I just have to pick another day. And what I've discovered, believe it or not, is that I think God knew what he was talking about when he did this whole Sabbath thing. <laughs> what, I, what I've discovered is that when I prioritize Sabbath rest, and I wish I could say that I was preaching this to you, and man, Aaron's really got Sabbath rest figured out. No, he does not. Josiah and I are in constant, like, we're constantly, like, on each other about doing that. If you know anything about the church and people's lives, it doesn't stop. It makes it very, very difficult. So we're constantly on each other, and we're not always the best. So this message is just as much for me as it is for you. But what I've learned is that when I prioritize Sabbath rest, I find myself being a harder worker for the rest of the week. I find that I'm a better pastor, and I find that I'm a happier and healthier person. And I truly believe that the same will, be, will prove true to you in your own way if you start taking the Sabbath seriously too. 
So to apply all this, church, I want you to pick a day. I want you to pick a day. With tomorrow being Labor Day, if not today, and you have it off, guess what? You already got your Sabbath for the week. Allison's been teasing me all week. She's like, which day are we taking off? Which, way, which day are we taking as a Sabbath, and which day are we laboring? That's what she keeps saying. So we labored yesterday. We are laboring today. Tomorrow we are resting. <clears throat> but pick a day. Make it your Sabbath. That's what it was created for anyways. When, if, if not, then too. Think of this. If you don't have off, then pick another day. If no day is available, take two half days until you can make a full day happen. Either way, it's time to break down the idol we've made of work by restoring Sabbath rest, church. Hear me when I say this. The Sabbath is a gift from God given for your enjoyment and your betterment. It's just as important as the hard work we pride ourselves in. We must understand that the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you. Don't be foolish and disregard it. Get some rest. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for the foresight that you have to know all the way at the beginning before our creation that we needed time off. Lord Jesus, I thank you for uh, this Labor Day weekend and the opportunity that many of us have to rest. Lord, for those of us who are unable to rest, I pray that you open up opportunity later this week. Lord, even if it's just an evening that someone can just relax and enjoy something in this life, I pray that they would take it. Lord, let us not lose heart or forget that you created the Sabbath for us. Let us learn to honor the Lord's day as we are doing today. And at the same time, let us also learn to observe the Sabbath as we can. You have called us to work hard. Give us the strength to work hard, but also help us to prioritize even if it's just a little time of rest because, Lord, you know more than we do that we need it. Teach us these things, Lord. We pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right. Welcome to our time of communion. Um, I just want to read for you guys today a passage from Matthew 16. Um, so Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. I think in this conversation that we've been having these last couple of weeks on idols that we have in our lives, um, we often fail to do just what Jesus is saying here. Um, and we fail to understand the cost of what it means to follow Jesus and to live our life alongside him and follow his lead. Um, like we were talking about last week, we get either too comfortable and we try to gain all the comforts that the world has. Or this week, we work too hard and we try to gain all that the world has by earning extra overtime hours or, you know, connecting our identity too much to our work. But whichever one of those it is, Jesus is telling us here, the cost of that is that we will lose the opportunity of discipleship with one another and with God. And so as we come to our time of communion today, I just ask you to pray over what we've been talking about um, in the sermons, that you consider ways that comfort and work both are getting in the way of your relationship with God, your ability to pursue discipleship. 
will you pray with me today? Dear Jesus, um, I just want to thank you for this time that we have together today um, to join in communion with one another um, in your presence. God, I pray that we can come before you humbly um, and with a spirit of humility, that we are willing to take up the cross that you have given us to follow you into discipleship, um, to put aside the pride that we have in our work and um, the comfort that we have um, in our environment, and that we lay it all before you and follow your lead. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Um, we at Restore practice open communion, so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you can participate with us no matter your church background. Um, and you can take the elements however you please. You can sit back down. You can stand and pray. You can kneel however you're comfortable. But let us partake together in the Lord's communion. Okay, as we wrap up another week, there's just a few last announcements. And so summer workshops are winding down. Our very last one, I believe, for the summer is this Thursday at Karen Kane's house. It's about committed relationships. It's for those who are um, hoping to be in a relationship or who are in a relationship, just sharing with each other and uh, growing and kind of just understanding what it takes to really be in a healthy, committed relationship. And then connect groups are starting up. And so uh, there are three that are gonna be happening. And uh, the first is The Chosen. And that is going to be on Wednesday nights, which Monday nights, okay, sorry. <laughs> Monday nights. And that is gonna be at Janice and Gill's house here in Highland. And then Josiah is gonna be leading spiritual gifts and that's gonna be at Monty and Laura's house. And that's on Wednesday nights, thank you. <laughs> All right, and then letters to the church at Aaron and Allison's house and I'm guessing that is on Thursday nights. Okay, and so they will be kicking off that third week of September. So we'll have a lot more information uh, soon. And also if you have the app on your phone, I'm sure the dates will be listed there as well. All right, something kind of cool with um, the uh, night that The Chosen is gonna be done is that the youth group is also invited to join. And so this is for our middle schoolers and high schoolers who would like to uh, be a part of this. They will watch the show, The Chosen, with everybody else, and then they're gonna split off and have their own um, discussion and conversations. And um, so that again is Monday nights at 6.30 at Janice and Gills. All right, uh, for those of you who listened to Allie a few weeks back talk about her experience in Tijuana, the fact that the folks there really needed a lot of things to help them cope, to just get by, um, they are, um, we actually have re received quite a few donations of shoes and socks, and uh, the biggest uh, issue right now, I think, is just getting the money to ship all of those. Uh, so if anybody would like to make a donation, is there a deadline for that, Aaron? Okay, September, oh. <laughs> if I read the slide. All right, so yeah, make a donation by September 30th. If you wanted to leave something in the offering, make sure that you just designate it, that that's what it's for. But um, we would love any kind of financial assistance to help make sure that those uh, items can get down to the folks there. All right, the seasoned group will be meeting on Saturday, September 7th for dinner at five at Peel Woodfire Pizza in Edwardsville. If you've never had Peel, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so uh, make sure to be there for that. And women's ministry, uh, we've had a Secret Sisters event going on through the summer and uh, we're going to do the final reveal. That'll be this coming Friday the 6th at uh, Alhambra Township. And so we're gonna have um, 
a final gift and snacks to share. There's going to be pizza. Just the first part of that will be the reveal, but then, and everybody is welcome to come because we'll do some games and activities afterwards. So it's just going to be a lot of fun and a chance for everybody to get together and share. The meal packing event, Saturday, September 14th. It's coming up really fast. So uh, less than two weeks now is gonna be here at the Weinheimer. I was talking with Allison beforehand and we're up to 16 tables. Yes. <laughs> So um, we need to know soon, though, if folks are interested in joining, if you're bringing, I'm trying to recruit a few folks, if you have friends or family that you're trying to get involved, uh, there is uh, the sign-up sheet in the back if you want to be part of the restore tables. Uh, but let Allison know as soon as possible so that we can just make plans, the final plans and the arrangements for how we're going to lay out the tables and where everybody's going to be, what everybody's going to be doing. So again, just a reminder, um, thanks to the generosity of all the donations here at the church, this is free for folks to participate, which is an extra blessing. All right, community garden is still going, um, and we still do need some volunteers to help with weeding, with watering, with harvesting. And so I believe the calendars are in the back on the table there as well if you'd like to sign up for a day or a week where you can come and help with that. The garden is here in Highland at Hannah's house. So if anybody is interested in helping out, just let us know. Um, we can get you um, going. All right. And that is it. As always, the prayer station is open. We got Connie and Rob over there today. They'd be more than happy to pray with you over anything that you might have in your heart today, uh, or if you're more just comfortable writing something down, and then the prayer group will focus on that over the week. So, all right, I think that's everything. And so thank you for all being here, and we will see you again next week.